Hello and welcome to the State of the Service Roadshow for Western Australia. My name is Hua Wood and I will be your MC and facilitator for today. I would like to start by acknowledging the Woodjuk people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm broadcasting from today and to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that acknowledgement to the traditional custodians on whose country you are participating and pay my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have joined us today. So thank you for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and to hearing from our keynote speaker um, and lots of reflections. I think a lot has happened for the APS over the last 12 months. Um, so it'll be good to hear some of your questions as well. So today's session will commence with a keynote address from the first Assistant Commissioner Head of Academy, Mr. Grant Lovelock. And this will be followed by a short video and then a panel discussion where you, the audience, can ask questions of any of our speakers here today. Jody Bruin and I will join Grant on the panel to answer your questions, and I'll tell you a little more about Jody later in the session. Now, it's my pleasure to hand over to Grant, First Assistant Commissioner, Head of Academy, for the Commissioner's Address. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're joining from today and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues joining us today. Today, I welcome you, our Western Australian colleagues, to our State of the Service Roadshow series. We have around 7,000 members of the APS in Western Australia, and today is an opportunity for us to reflect on 2021 and discuss where we're heading in the future. I'm sure that you'll agree it's been a big couple of years for all Australians. The challenges thrown at the APS have been significant. With the ongoing issue, impacts of the pandemic and natural disasters, including bushfires across parts of Western Australia, your continued dedication in delivering for the Australian community is incredibly admirable. There are more than 153,000 people in the APS working across 97 agencies and 14 portfolios in more than 567 locations across Australia and the globe. I think you'll agree that the APS has an incredible reach and with that a wide range of responsibilities. What you do matters, from persuasive policy advice to government, regulation and service delivery, the work you do touches the lives of every Australian. The latest State of the Service report outlines a service that's fully engaged and committed to the task we face of delivering for our fellow Australians. As we've seen in previous years, this task is not likely to get easier. The demands on good governance, on statecraft, and our capacity to collaborate and work as a cohesive public service will continue to grow, as will the expectations of government. The world around us is constantly changing, and our attention over the last two years has been dominated by crisis, both here at home and internationally. For the APS, this has meant making rapid changes, often under increasing pressure, as the needs of citizens and governments shift dramatically. The pandemic continues to illustrate the increasing complexity of our work, a public health crisis with implications on our economy, our regulatory systems, national security and how we deliver services, integrate technology and data and mobilise our workforce. This pandemic will pass, but the challenges around geopolitical and societal volatility, technological change and economic disruption will not. As we continue to effectively serve the government and the Australian people, we'll need a public service that is driven by data and a sophisticated use of technology. We also need an APS that is collaborative and works as one enterprise in dealing with increasingly complex and interconnected issues. We need an APS with diverse backgrounds and experiences that's truly reflective of the modern Australian economy who, through an inclusive culture, can leverage the breadth of perspectives and expertise that resides in each and every team across our organisation. What this adds to is that fundamentally, we need an APS that's committed to its values, to service, is ethical, respectful, accountable and impartial. Public service reform is a never-ending journey. Much of it is about cultural change and that takes time as well as a coordinated leadership but it also, it's also about how we attract, retain and develop our people capability to make sure that our employee value proposition is strong and that we stay competitive in the pursuit of talent. The independent review into the APS by David Thody proposed 
wide-scale changes to ensure the APS was fit for the future. The report built on previous work, including the blueprint for reform from 2010. The report focused on the need for a more joined up, people facing, data enabled, capable and trusted public service that's able to deliver effectively in a rapidly changing operating context. The government agreed with the majority of the independent panel's 40 recommendations and our secretary's board, our most senior leadership group, to take these forward, a challenge they accepted. The Secretary's Board has used the pandemic to accelerate the implementation of practical reform and to make a difference. The public service 10 years from now will look very different from the public service of today. Clearly it requires a major focus on our people and our capability. It's now a year since we launched the APS Workforce Strategy. The strategy is the foundation for driving the alignment of APS initiatives and investment to attract the best develop the capability of APS employees and mobilise people to our highest priority work. Implementation of the strategy is supported by the APSC's Centre for Excellence in Workforce Planning. This small team is having a huge impact in its support across APS agencies, fostering workforce transformation across the enterprise whilst meeting the unique circumstances of agencies. System level thinking and ensuring the enduring capability of our people is at the heart of APS reform. Last year, we established the APS Academy. It's a hub of learning for employees at all stages of their career, with a focus on the core craft capabilities that are critical for a world-class public service. Under each of these capabilities is an array of learning and development opportunities available to every APS employee, irrespective of location or career stage. These include, but are not limited to, foundation training in topics such as integrity and delivering great policy, professional development in topic areas such as human-centred design or engaging stakeholders through the delivery of SES masterclasses that recognise the unique operating environment of our APS people. An APS Academy faculty made up of respected current and recent APS senior practitioners guide the design and delivery of programs on offer. It's part of a deliberate new approach to learning and development that leverages the strengths and areas of expertise across the APS and seeks to embed a culture of continuous learning. One example is the EL2 professional development program under development right now. We're seeking to offer a flexible pathway for participants to choose learning components that emphasise the particular areas of capability aligned to one APS and APS wide needs. For example, managing hybrid teams or developing leadership capabilities. We're looking to start rolling the program out later this year, so you'll be hearing more about this in the coming months. An APS learning board made up of senior APS and external experts has also been established to look at new ways to build capability across our 153 strong workforce. To best support people to develop the skills and expertise they need to deliver for the Australian people, the communities we serve and government. One of its early priorities has been to reduce duplication and inefficiencies in learning and development purchasing practices across the APS. A new learning marketplace is being explored, aimed at increasing competition and innovation in the market, and also ensuring we get the biggest capability uplift from the dollars we spend. And to ensure we can make the best use of our expertise and resources in a fast moving and interconnected world, we've undertaken a review of APS hierarchy and classification. The review looks at ways to make sure we better value and utilise the expertise and contribution from people at all levels, roles, functions and locations across Australia. It addresses how modern and flexible ways of working can support more effective decision making, remove, remove bureaucratic barriers and promote greater mobility and responsiveness. The pandemic underscores this need. With the APS demonstrating through COVID how empowered teams, reduced hierarchy and a one APS mindset support timely data-driven decisions by government, as well as enable mobilisation of employees and effort to support the priority needs of our community. Structural change occurs rarely in the APS. In the 120 year history of the APS, the classification system we have today is the result of two major reforms. A shake up in the late 1980s and then a move to the current APS executive level structures in 1998. Nearly a quarter of a century on, and in a vastly different operating environment, it's not just timely, but essential to ask whether our existing culture and structure inhibits our capacity for innovation, agility and delivery in a world 
and for our leaders to demonstrate a willingness for bold change. Thinking about digital and ICT transformation, I think we all agree that this will play a significant part in the APS being fit for the future. A digital review has provided baseline APS digital and ICT capabilities, and we have a sharp focus now on a whole of APS approach to digital funding. Supported by the Digital Transformation Agency, the APS is working to ensure that we're investing in the right things at the right time and moving in a strategic and coordinated way. One aspect of this will be sharing and reusing digital capabilities to optimise our investments across government. If one agency invests in a new technology, design, pattern or skill, we want the rest of the APS to be able to easily leverage this. The digital government strategy sees government using advanced technology to meet the needs and expectations of the public, offering stable, secure and reliable services. This digital service vision is already being tested every day, supporting record numbers of people seeking COVID-related support and, more recently, flood-related support. And while there's plenty of room for improvement, we are meeting demand in ways that could not have been imagined five or ten years ago. Technology alone, however, will, not, will only take us so far. The new Australian data strategy supports stronger decision-making through making better use of our data. And it's critical that we continue to grow the necessary skills to make the best use of these transformative technologies and valuable data sets. These actions work hand in hand with the APS Academy and, have, and we have invested in growing data and digital capability directly through the APS professions. The digital and data professions have grown over the past 12 months with more than 3,000 of you signing up and accessing training, career development and opportunities through communities of practice. If you haven't already signed up, I encourage you to do so through the APSC website. We've also had record, no record numbers of applicants and participants coming through our data and digital entry programs. Ultimately, however, improved APS capability is about delivering tangible benefits for the communities we serve. We need to be vigilant and remain grounded in our approach to what needs to change and what remains of enduring value. To be an APS fit for the future, we need to manage the increasing complexity and interconnectedness of issues and the expectations of government and the Australian people. And we have to look ahead at a shifting horizon. Our reform ambitions need to keep moving with the changing landscape and also with the changing nature of work and the workplace, often dubbed the future of work. First, we're living through a fundamental transformation in the nature of the work we do and the skills we need for a high-performing APS. Digital technology pervades work environments everywhere. To be a leading digital economy and take advantage of changes in machine learning, advances in artificial intelligence and digitisation, the APS needs to scale its digital infrastructure and skill its workforce. 71% of agencies have said that critical skill shortages exist in data, digital and ICT. To illustrate this, it's been estimated that Australia will need approximately 156,000 more digital technology workers by 2025, against a backdrop of global digital skill shortages. We're in a fiercely competitive labour market for talent, and we need to get better at keeping up with rapidly changing skill requirements for our workforce. We're making positive steps in building strong capability pipelines for data and digital careers in the APS with initiatives like Career Pathfinder. At the same time, we need to develop our data and digital literacy across the whole workforce. Second, we need to reimagine where we work. Learning from the at-scale working from home experience and accessing new talent pools across the country to bring in the skills that we need. We need to retain expertise and develop capabilities within our existing workforce. But that alone cannot provide all the solutions. We also need to bring in expertise to reinforce our capability. Our capacity to attract those who may require a substantial shift in our, may require a substantial shift in our perceptions of where work can be done. Hybrid working, splitting time between the office and home is not a new concept and will almost certainly be an ongoing feature of a contemporary APS. Whilst many of you are doing this already, leaders across the APS will need to be well equipped at leading and managing dispersed teams. The use of flexible work arrangements in the APS, including working from home, predates the COVID-19 pandemic and will be a mainstay for the APS to be seen as an employer of choice. However, 
we must continue to strike the right balance between flexible work arrangements and delivering on behalf of government and the Australian people. For example, many of us are employed in frontline roles or on secure IT environments where the notion of flexibility may look very different. Skill shortages in the broader Australian labour market and strong competition for specialist talent and expertise increasingly requires flexible and innovative ways in which to attract and retain our staff. For example, most of the digital and data roles are advertised in Canberra, but we know that more than 90% of the talent within digital and data skills is located outside of the ACT. Decisions about flexibility and where we work can remove the geographic boundaries that exist in recruitment. This also presents an opportunity for the APS by bringing us closer to the communities we serve, helping to improve service design and delivery. Crucially, however, in a competitive war on talent, it enables us to tap into labour markets right across Australia. Third, the things we've experienced through the pandemic have shown us that flexibility is possible in the APS, and new ways of working can and do empower staff and deliver positive outcomes. One of the successes of this period has been the ability for the APS to work together with new opportunities for collaboration between agencies. Public servants, including those listening today, have also been deployed right across the APS at pace and scale not seen before. One example of this is the APS Surge Reserve. More than 4,500 4 people were deployed from across the APS to surge to priority work over the past two years. As we speak, approximately 500 people are deployed to Services Australia from 23 agencies, assisting in the processing of disaster payments to Australians as a result of devastating floods in Queensland and that are ongoing in Queensland and New South Wales. This collaboration and enterprise-wide approach means skills, knowledge and capacities can be drawn from across organisational boundaries to better meet the urgent needs of Australians. The need for collaboration across traditional agency lines is only going to continue. We will need to ensure that our culture and structure are well suited to this way of operating. Today, 50% of employees in the APS are digital natives from Gen Y and Gen Z who expect their roles to reflect technological advances and new ways of working. Building on a strong platform of continuous reform and to prepare for the future of work, a new Future of Work Secretary Subcommittee has been established. To develop practical and evidence-based actions and to ensure we can attract, develop and retain the capabilities and talent we need to work in this new way. I want to finish up by talking about the relationship between the public service ministers and their officers. This is timely as we start to prepare for the outcomes of the federal election. Irrespective of the outcome, it'll signal a renewed agenda from the government of the day. Our caretaker conventions guide our approach during this election period. It's important that each of us is aware of the caretaker conventions and how they apply to our work. How the APS manages transitions in an election context is one of the ways that we act with impartiality and demonstrate our wider stewardship. One of the great strengths of Australian democracy is the way that we manage the transition between governments or ensure continuity and renewal for a returned government. This is of course underpinned by the preparation of incoming government briefs or the red and blue books provided to the party voted into power by the electorate. The smooth management of this transition is fundamental for the safety and prosperity of Australians. But more than that, a strong partnership between the APS, ministers and their staff is at the core of the Westminster system. And it operates at its best when characterised by mutual trust, respect and confidence. Not every member of the APS will have a direct contact with ministers or their staff, but it's important that every member of the APS is aware of and respects these roles. Working with a ministerial liaison, office, uh, ministerial liaison reference panel Guidance has been published for the APS to establish strong partnerships. They cover working with ministers, the role of departmental liaison officers and the operating environment of the ministerial office and supporting ministerial transitions. The APS Academy, the panel has also assisted to develop a new Strengthening Partnerships SES leadership program. We're now building on that work to develop a complementary program for parliamentarians and their staff to ensure they can get the best from the APS. In conclusion, 
I'm sure you'll agree that there will always be natural, natural and global forces at work that will throw up complex challenges for us as a service to manage. What form the next challenge will be is undetermined. Even undetermined, each new challenge will require a fine-tuned statecraft and the APS working at its best. If we are to effectively serve the Australian people and government, we need to work in partnership and as one APS to harness the diverse perspectives and knowledge our organisation can bring. The Australian Public Service is world class because of the sense of service that you all embody and the values that guide our work. Thank you for the work that you do and all the best for the rest of 2022. Thank you, Grant. And if you've got any questions for Grant, just a reminder that he will be joining us on the panel discussion a little bit later. So one of the themes that Grant has just mentioned was one APS and how we are all working towards the same goal. And at the end of last year, a video was created to showcase just how diverse the APS is. And we would like to show you this now. Hi, I'm Kanchi from Newcastle. Hi, I'm Mark from Hobart. I'm Yana from Canberra, which is not a country. Today, um, I'm Simon from Brisbane. Your name, I'm Kay and I work in Geelong, Rory? Victoria. My name is Mirage and I'm based in sunny Nauru. I'm Zara, based in Fitzroy Crossing, over 3,800 kilometres away from Canberra. What 1APS means to me is working towards something bigger than yourself. Engaging, collaborating and sharing knowledge. No barriers between agencies. We already have a good history of coming together to solve complex problems. Bringing all of that diversity that people bring with their backgrounds. Through teamwork and collaboration. This is 1APS in action. We provide face-to-face -face service support to our most vulnerable, remote, disadvantaged and Indigenous customers. I've helped customers with bushfire claims, with flood claims, even cyclone claims. Helping Australians from culturally and linguistically diverse background. Bettering the lives of the Australian community. <laughs> like this little guy. I want to have one APS that can demonstrate people um, with disabilities in leadership um, positions. It's just been great to be part of one APS where we all work together. Towards a common goal as one APS. One APS. We now move to our panel discussion and a reminder that if you've got a question for the panel, please send it through to the questions and answers tab on my Gov, on, um, Gov Teams. If you see a question and also want to hear the answer, you can also like the question to vote it up. As I mentioned earlier, we have Jodie who will be joining Grant and I for the panel session. So Jodie Bruin is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Indigenous Australians Agency. Welcome Jodie and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So my first question is actually for you, Jodie. What's your advice for managers and teams in implementing change and positioning in the APS for the future? Yeah, uh, look, I, I suppose firstly, uh, one of the important things to me is um, culture. Um, so I firstly will say Wandiwa, uh, which is hello in Injibundi. Um, so I'm an Injibundi person from WA, so hi WA. Uh, but Dura and Nuna Dura and Nuna, which is that I won uh, Nanawal country at the moment, and can I pay respects to uh, traditional owners of uh, the uh, Wajak Nunga people over there as well in Perth, uh, but also uh, pay respects to any Aboriginal people on this call today. Uh, I was recently in WA visiting teams in Broome, uh, Port Hedland, and uh, Perth, and I, I, I suppose. Um, in, in terms of this question, I think uh, keeping in contact with your teams is really critical to, to making sure that we implement change well. Um, so I just want to that point is I'm based in Canberra. The work that we lead as an agency and the APS uh, lead and deliver for Australians is, is um, 
right across Australia. And so we've got to make sure people are supported in all of those roles wherever they are, that they've got the tools to deliver their work, that they're connected into the main and they feel part of that bigger picture. And that one APS is really important to that. And so how do we connect people a little bit better um, I think there was a, a comment there before about um, departments operating pretty much on their own in silos. How do we actually get them to work together more? That collaboration piece, I think, is really important. But if, you, if you're talking about change, I think you've got to plan it really well. <laughs> Um, but at the same time, I think uh, over the last sort of uh, couple of years uh, of COVID, we've had to respond quite quickly and you haven't had that luxury of planning a change as well as you would normally. But the, it's actually the, you know, for successful change uh, has to be well planned planned and have a lot of different voices involved in that planning. Um, so people from all throughout an organisation or a department uh, right across Australia being involved in that, making sure that you've looked at all the options, making sure there's a lot of transparency around that change. Um, and making sure people are behind the change as well. Have you sold that change enough so that people are actually behind it? Um, and and um, as I said, making sure, you know, to me, the planning side of it before you implement is more important than the implementation side. So that, that engagement across different teams, but keeping the focus on uh, our, our clients, if you like, having that, that human centre design is something I think we've got to really do a lot more of. Um, and, and I think, again, uh, the pandemic's uh, and, and our responses to COVID and bushfires and a whole range of other things has actually meant we've, we've learned a little bit more about agility and response uh, and how we could do it better. Uh, you can't always have every, every T crossed and every I dotted when you've got to respond to things quite quickly. Um, so you've got to be ready to move. And I think we've, we've shown it um, in the Australian Public Service that you can actually do that quite well. Get in get things done and, and respond to those crises. And uh, that sort of disruption is not going to change. So we actually need to build in, if you like, that, that agility uh, to the public sector. Positioning for the future means we've got to be ready to be able to change when we need to. Um, and uh, so, so I, I suppose building that in, uh, having that real client and people focus, um, as uh, Grant was saying, that, that sort of human-centred design um, the, the sort of work of the academy and the master classes, building that data capability. And I know for NIAA, we've been doing a lot of that work uh, and having um, people engaged in, in um, the data master classes has really, really been fantastic. I think it actually is building the capability of our teams in that space. Um, so I think we've got a lot, lot of um, great people out there. We've got to make sure they've got the, the tools and resources and training and we've built that capability um, so that they can actually deliver on their on their work. But we've also got to have that expectation of being able to be agile and move when we need to and work across our, our different departments and agencies. Excellent. Lots of um, really great points there, Jody. And I think you know that flexibility and agility was really showcased in um, our collective response to COVID, which is uh, fantastic. So my next question is for you, Grant. Um, recent federal budget announcements mentioned an investment into a pilot of four APS Academy campuses alongside universities. Can you tell us more about the data training and employment opportunities that this will provide for people living in regional areas and areas outside of Canberra? Yeah, thanks, Hua. Um, so this is a $18 million investment by government into uh, a new way of looking at how we build on some of the work we've done in data and digital uh, across the APS uh, through the professions and, and by the, the Commission over the last little while. And I think um, it goes a, li a little bit to some of what Jodie was talking about in, in her response to her question around planning. I suspect part here is... Um, over the last few years, we've been increasingly collecting data about the demands in our workforce. And we're seeing, as I said, I think in my keynote, 70% of agencies report shortages in digital and, and data. And I think probably what we're seeing there is as a service, we're, um, as Jody said, getting better at how we use those skills and capabilities and our business is, is changing. So there's a greater demand for those skills, both in terms of specialists, but also increasingly in how our, our generalist um, uh, cohort adopt some of those data and digital capabilities in their the work too. These campuses go to looking at how we create additional pathways for people into the APS and really start to look at a different way of thinking about location. So mm. traditionally in our entry level programs, you've, you've needed to 
to come to Canberra um, and to, to do the program um, in Canberra and located here. This really goes to uh, looking at how we start to think about what opportunities exist for people to um, build careers, uh, either post-university um, or in fact through these pilots looking at apprenticeships, traineeships, cadetships, different ways of coming into the service. I myself came into the APS through an apprenticeship pathway and so am, am pretty passionate about the opportunity that coming in um, through that sort of that sort of a program provides to really understand the way the business works and to develop skills while you're in the, the, the business and within the organisation. And increasingly we're seeing a need for us to um, develop our skills and capabilities in the workforce that we already have or to build their skills while they're working with us. And that's not different to, to lots of other large employers. Uh, so these campuses, there'll be four to start with, uh, the sort of next evolution of, of the academy, which has been focused on APS craft, now looking at how working with the professions we can identify pathways that exist through existing programs in universities uh, for people to have completed and, and come into their APS career still located kind of adjacent to the university campus, uh, or in fact to come in and commence their study, commence their learning pathway, um, as part of that, that campus, but also uh, contribute to the work of the APS from there. And then once they've completed, stay on uh, in a role in that location and, and kind of cement their APS career in, in that location rather than needing to think about having to move mm -hmm. around. Yeah, and I think um, you, you see more increasingly the new generation are really um, looking at who they work for as well because they want to make a contribution, kind of see that. So it's a great initiative to try and tap into that really early on in people's study and where they're looking to start their careers. So that's great. Absolutely. Thanks, Grant. Well, I've got a question for you. Um, what do you see as the main challenges for service delivery in the APS? Oh, that's a good question, Grant. Um, I think there's a few things, if I reflect on the last couple of years, and I'll just talk a bit more from the experience of um, what we went through at the ATO, because I think that uh, I can relate most to that. But I think really uh, there is a challenge for us in meeting expectations of our clients, but also managing those expectations. There might be um, different uh, sort of cohorts that you will need to think about, you know, where are they at in their stage of life? Um, like the new cohort that's coming through, they're all digital first. How do we actually engage with them early so that they're able to participate in the community in the um, services that government provide to them in, in the optimal way. And I think that uh, that data and technology piece is just so important, not just from understanding who you're servicing, uh, also who your staff are, who are available and the skill sets that they have, but it enables us to make evidence-based decisions, right? So when we're collecting a lot of the data, I think one of the journeys we're on in the ATO at the moment is to make sure that everyone understands um, that data and data analytics is a component of the work going forward. That in some respects, uh, you can't sort of just say that that is someone else's job and you just have this, It's part, it will pervade everyone's work and to get a, a leg up in terms of understanding how to use the data that we're collecting. Mm. And I think that also allows for some transferable skills across the APS as well, because once we are actually starting to build those baseline data um, skills, and that doesn't mean that you need to be able to go through reams of spreadsheets. Goodness knows my background's in law, so I don't know anything about numbers, but, um, and I know that's ironic working at the ATO, but I think it's just a question around, you know, how do you actually use the data that we have so that you can actually do your job better, understand that you're actually focusing the, the programs that we have to the maximum um, potential, and also how do we track that? So it's not just data that we bring into the organisation and how people do the work that they do to provide the services, but it's also using data, do we need to create a different way of measuring the impact of what we're doing so that the actual intent of the programs that we have are actually bringing fruit as we had expected them to. So I think, you know, meeting the expectations of our community is really important, particularly around tailored service. So people are expecting that government is going to provide much more tailored service because they know we're collecting a lot of the data. So how do you actually use that so that there is better engagement when people do come and ask for services from the APS? 
So thanks for that question, Grant. And um, we'll take some questions from the audience now. So if you've been um, linking, listening to the keynote speech or some of the responses and have got a burning question for us, please send them through and we'll be able to um, put one of the panelists on the spot, hopefully not me, but <laughs> uh, we'll just see what questions we're gonna get through from the moderator. And I think, um, you know, there is a question around, um, and I might just uh, put this to you, Jodie. You know, if young people are the future, um, what can we do to increase the employment of people in their 20s? We heard from Grant about the APS um, Academy sort of um, opening up in relation to the universities, but what else do you think we can do to encourage younger people to join the APS and see it as a career? Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, I suppose I'm a champion of all diversity, so um, age being one of those things, but I'd like to see uh, a more diverse uh, APS across the board. Um, and what I find uh, with a lot of our young people, they really want to be in the APS because of the change that they can be part of. Like they're very passionate about the area that they choose to work in. And so a couple of things, I think, um, We've got to be able to uh, show and demonstrate um, that uh, we are part of a big change agenda. We've got to be able to sell that and say to people, this is what you can be a part of. This is why it's so exciting to work in the APS. Uh, but they also, um, I do find, uh, want to be able to make that difference and make a change and not, you know, like they actually want to be able to contribute. So we've got to open the door for them to contribute fully and feel really engaged in the workplace. Um, obviously, things like the, the data and technology, but then uh, is really important to them. And how do we use that to be, as I think I said before, in a really sophisticated way. Um, but also people will want to have that, that mobility across across departments and across the APA. It's not, I, I, I don't know that this thing of, this is where I'm gonna stay for my whole life or, or a career or, or even 10 years, but that mobility across uh, uh, departments, but also across jurisdictions and states, and they might wanna be in Canberra for a bit, but they might wanna be somewhere else. I think the other thing is to make sure that we're not just recruiting to Canberra roles and, and Grant talked about the apprenticeships and that then not just having to be in Canberra, but, you know, and I, I do think, um, into the future, we should be having uh, a lot more APS roles out in, in various regional areas um, uh, because it, it, with the technology we have now, it shouldn't actually be a problem to have people working all across Australia. But that's also where our clients are. That's where we've got, we've got to be, uh, if we're going to be um, yeah, human centred, that's where our, our clients are. So we've got to be right across Australia. And so whether that's a very remote location or whether it's it's Perth or whether it's um, or, or whether it's Darwin, you know, we've got to have people out in those areas who understand the location, who understand the challenges. Um, and I, I, I do think um, people want that sort of mobility as, as well. They want some options. They want to have uh, a career path, but they want to know that they're, they're um, able to make that difference because I think there's a real passion there to be part of that. Yeah, I think that's great and a great call out in terms of, you know, remote and regional areas. I think, um, you know, we've all become quite okay with all of the online technologies that we can use to yeah. collaborate and do our work. So great opportunities yeah. there. So yeah. Grant, a question for you, it's actually combining two questions. So um, with regards to the APS Academy, what sort of reskilling might be available to APS workers in the future. And with the borders now open, is there plan for more face-to-face -face training to happen here in WA? Yeah, thanks for So um, I, might, I might talk locations first and then talk about the reskilling uh, part of that question. So COVID's been a real challenge for um, running a, a training um, arm of the APS um, and not just in terms of the, the locations piece, but just being able to kind of plan how much face-to-face -face delivery we do and coming in and out of, of, of lockdowns meant that we had to move pretty quickly to make some decisions about how we manage the face-to-face -face components of our courses. Um, and now if you look at the Academy website, you get a really clear picture of what's being delivered um, face-to-face, -face, what's a mixed delivery in terms of uh, components being face-to-face -face and, and virtual, um, and what's wholly virtual. Uh, now that we are in a position where we can kind of plan a bit more and setting the, the calendar and talking to agencies about the 2022-23 uh, operating year, 
we are looking at kind of our location strategy. What's really important here is that we can have conversations with agencies about what they're interested in, their people being able to participate in uh, and get a sense, particularly in uh, the jurisdictions, ha how much demand is there for particular programs so that we can schedule things for people to come together from different agencies. One of the things we really like to, um, to achieve through our academy programs uh, is where people are coming together that they're actually getting the opportunity to develop and build networks beyond their own agency and opportunities to understand how their work might relate to other people participating in the program so that's definitely a focus for us for 2022-23 um, and and the calendar will make really clear where we're delivering things having said that if if people tuning in today are interested in being able to participate in programs, we can and do do what we call in-agency delivery. So where there's sufficient demand for people um, in, a, in an individual agency or where there might be a couple of agencies with a presence in WA that say, we'd really like our people to be able to participate in this, we're mm. absolutely able to have a conversation about how we can bring that together. And that still gives people then the opportunity to um, meet people who they might not otherwise uh, have the opportunity to come across. On the reskilling uh, bit, there's absolutely a focus on, on reskilling in the Secretary's Future of Work subcommittee and how it is that we support that sort of reskilling, retraining effort of our people, including into some of the data and digital areas. And that's been a bit of a focus of, of some of the work of the professions as well. What we're looking at is um, there's, there's a reskilling framework that's that's been developed that looks at how we support agencies to understand what their reskilling effort might be. We're now doing some work to look at how that might become information for individuals. And off the back of um, the planning piece that we're doing with Secretary's Board each year as a result of the workforce strategy that identifies what our skills um, and capability demands are as a system, how it is that we might then back that in with a reskilling effort. Having said that, I think the breadth of uh, content that sits in uh, APS Craft is also an opportunity for people to do a bit of kind of self-directed, self-navigable reskilling. So if you've spent all of your time in service delivery, as an example, and want to understand a bit more about um, policy development, policy design, I'd encourage you to, to be talking with your managers about participating in something like Delivering Great Policy, um, which gives you a bit of a framework for understanding how we do policy development, design in government, how you start to think about those interaction points with kind of program management and service delivery. Um, and, and so I think that's just one of the examples of things that exist at a, at a kind of job family level within the academy. And then there's, of course, things like human-centred design that you can go in and from a professional development perspective, develop some new skills in that will be relevant to your work, but start to give you um, some other tools, frameworks and perspectives to look at the way that you do your own work. Um, and then, you know, the, the Academy is all about connecting you with learning that exists across the system as well, not just that, that we deliver directly out of the, the Academy. So things like the behavioural insights training that comes out of uh, the beta team in PMC, uh, there's some really interesting project management and change uh, content coming out of uh, home affairs. So there's lots of things that you can connect in that start to build your skills in other areas and might mean, you know, inc increasingly we're looking for people that can manage projects and, and kind of bring a really strong project management skill set to, to pieces of work. Yeah. So that's yeah. another example of where it's not necessarily a significant reskilling effort, but you're just building your skills and capabilities in other areas that will apply to your current work, but mean that as the, the work continues to change and new opportunities emerge, particularly new opportunities to do different kinds of work in WA, that you're pre-positioned to be able to say, oh, well, I've, I've started to grow my skills in a, in a different area. Mm. Yeah, and no, I great. I think that's a great reflection in terms of being able to really access that material now. You don't have to wait um, for face-to-face -face training. There is just such a, a wealth of information that can really um, allow you to explore where you might want to take your career next. So that's a really great opportunity. So we've got a question for the panel, and I might pass to Jody first, uh, and then you to you, Grant. Um, in line with being one APS. Will we see an efficient process being put in place to allow for easier lateral moves and promotions within the APS? Because um, we currently see every APS department recruiting individually and competing with each other. We talked mm. about the, the war for talent. I think we have already yes. started um, being a bit more sort of more one APS with the data and analytics skills. But do you mm. see that trend um, moving forward because there is a lot of application fatigue as the question has put in there. So I might 
past you first, Jody, and then to you, Grant. Yeah, look, I think that's a really good point. Um, I think there's, there is a question of how people come into the APS and then they have some fluidity and flexibility and can have that mobility and how easy can we make that? Um, and I think at the moment it is it, it can be quite difficult. I think we need to really improve in that space so that people can move ease, more easily. Uh, I think, I think um, whether we share, like I know we, we often um, don't necessarily share the merit lists and things like that. And people should be able to say, look, I want a, a chance at that. In fact, I uh, had a meeting, was that yesterday, Grant? <laughs> I think uh, with Grant yesterday and uh, the Public Service Commissioner uh, on one of the, that was one of the topics actually is how do we make that easier for people to move around? How do they take you know an opportunity that might be in my, in my agency helping with a piece of work for three to six months in a regional area and how could we make that open to people so that they can put their hand up and say I'd really like to try that and as part of my professional development um, and they actually get a lot out of that. But you know we, we do put th people through uh, I suppose a lot of hoops in moving around as well and so how can we simplify that it's definitely a question that we need to take on yeah i, I agree jody i think there's much more we can do um in the in the systems and frameworks that sit around some mm. of our recruitment practices but I, th yeah. I think i'd really encourage people and again you know I, I might approach this from a sort of wa perspective in part um using your networks talking with your manager about what opportunities might exist mm. for you to get an experience where you are by kind of jumping into another agency uh, to do a specific piece of work i think what we'll see increasingly is um, kind of project-based secondment opportunities to go in and do a really specific thing there was some really interesting work done by the digital profession around sort of trialling micro secondments where uh, an organisation might have needed someone to come in and do a really specific sort of piece of work that was only two or three hours a week or, you know, five hours a month. Um, and so rather than going through the process of uh, trying to find someone who would come in and kind of do that as a, a, a semi-permanent role, they were actually looking at how can we encourage some mobility um, in that sort of micro secondment way. Um, and I know, so the Commissioner's recently updated his um, directions around uh, merit lists specifically and extended the period of time that uh, a merit list can be used and that a merit list sort of before a merit list expires, uh, which I think is great. What I still think we need to kind of do on the back of that is is then get better at how particularly in, in specific locations, agencies can come together and understand who might have been found successful for, through a process and where there might be another opportunity for them to be picked up. I think um, that's probably still an example where we, we think in a very role-based way um, and increasingly you know, thinking about how we might do um, a, a broader recruitment approach. And, and certainly you know, in, in particular locations, think about how agencies might come together to identify people who are interested in the roles they have now, but also start to then think about career pathway opportunities for people to move around and get different experiences um, in a particular location across different parts of government. That's certainly kind of historically been one of the really great opportunities of Canberra is that there's a, a concentration of, of agency representation mm -hmm. here that means you can do that movement. But I think you know increasingly as people want to be in, in different locations and stay connected to their families and communities in, in other parts of the country, starting to think about how we do recruitment um, and, and retention kind of opportunities for people um, in those locations to still give them that diversity of APS experience will be really important. Yeah, I think that's a really good um, call out, Grant, that it's not just about moving jobs. And I think my reflection on the question is about, you know, what where you want to map your career pathway. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a promotion to a new job. It might be a sideways transfer or, you know, we've just proven we can surge in the APS to put resources where they're most needed at any particular time, put your hand up for those experiences because it gives you an insight into different agencies and where you might want to be able to go. And also, um, you know, increasing your skill set so that you become more competitive when those um, processes come about. But I agree with both of you, there's more that we can do to provide more mobility across the APS. And um, I know being in Perth, you know, there's a lot that we could probably do just to build those networks more strongly um, and connect better sort of as an APS more locally as well. So thank you for that. Uh, so I think um, you've raised uh, the question around, um, you know, the upcoming election and the caretaker protocols. 
their grant. Do you have any advice on to, on how to manage third parties who are delivering services on behalf of the government through that election period? I think that's um, really front of mind for some agencies at the moment. Yeah, definitely. So I think um, I'd, I'd suggest anybody and everybody jump on and have a look at their caretaker convention guidance that, that gets updated ahead of each election and, and familiarises themselves with what's there. Your agency will also um, have a, a central area typically that that is um, liaising with the, the caretaker team in Prime Minister and Cabinet around some of the, the um, trickier, greyer things that, that might come across your, your desk in, in Caretaker. Around those big service delivery contracts and, and kind of big partner arrangements um, outside of government, I think, um, and, and these should be conversations you're having in your teams, I think, to start with, having a sense of how um, contentious, for, for want of a better word, the arrangement is. Is it something that um, if, if the government were returned or an alternative government uh, was to, to be formed, um, is it something that is likely to uh, need to, to change? Has there been you know, commentary through things like Senate estimates uh, or in the media that suggests it's an area of work that an alternative government might want to, to take a, a different approach to? That should be sort of your first signal and you will have a much better feel for, for some of that um, in relation to your specific areas of work. Uh, and, and where it's not, you, you t traditionally in, in, you know, reasonably safe ground to assume that it's a business as usual approach and these sh should be conversations you're having you know as an election kicks off and right the way through the caretaker um, period to just go back to that caretaker guidance have a look at whether you think um, the answer is clear or not and always you know if in doubt feel free to, to you know talk within your own um, uh, teams and, and to escalate those questions and, and ultimately through your caretaker teams in your agencies and, and back in PMC. and c But I think you will have, you will have a, a good sense for how to manage that. As for the day-to-day -day conversations that you might have with providers around, you know, what happens here, I think, again, you will be really well placed to, to be having those conversations in terms of the detail. But again, I think it's always good to just be um, testing, you know, some of the approaches you might take to those conversations in your teams, testing them within the organisation more broadly. Um, and and I, on things like this, I always go with kind of go with your gut. If you think, hang on a minute, there's something here that I have a bit of a worry about, have that conversation with your team, with your manager, um, and where it's not clear, kind of escalate to get further advice. I think, you know, these are things that it never hurts to to check um, and, and it's much better that you check rather than um, feel like you've, you've got to go in and, and tackle the conversation or tackle the approach alone and find out that maybe a, a conversation beforehand would have just led to a different outcome. But I think on these things and, and certainly with the kind of bigger uh, service delivery arrangements that we have in place, they're, technic they're traditionally sort of longer term um, arrangements, they're things that are in place, you know, certainly if it comes to setting up a new arrangement, I'm sure those conversations will have already been had if it's something that falls um, in the caretaker period and if for anybody, you know, who's thinking, oh hang on a minute, how does that apply to me, I'd, I'd encourage again to have a look at the caretaker guidance and have the chat in your team to start with. Yeah, there's always help available. I think it's it's always good to have those sort of chats and um, getting different points of view will always come up with a really good plan um, of attack. And I think you're right, you know, the gut feel for some of these things is really important. Mm. So we also have, um, you know, back on the, the theme of meaningful career pathways and um, regional locations, do, we, do you think, um, Jodie, that uh, there is enough being done around um, really greatly increasing the representation in regional areas, particularly to encourage more First Australians uh, into the senior ranks of the APS? Yeah, look, there is a strategy around this, but I think we all need to do more in that space. Um, and uh, I think one of the things, and Grant spoke to it before, about people uh, being required to leave community and leave uh, their families. And, and that actually is a, a bit of an inhibitor to us picking up a lot of um, uh, Indigenous people right across Australia in terms of where they want to be and where they want to work. And they might have great experience that they can offer us. The other part of it is um, uh, just making it a, a bit easier. I mean, I, I know even for myself, some of the, the hoops you have to jump through uh, does actually put people off. 
uh, not necessarily just on this occasion when I got the role, which is only three months ago, but you know, uh, prior as well, it can it can be very daunting for people coming into the APS. And so there's two things in terms of attracting people: there's the sort of culture you uh, offer them, uh, and and that safety, uh, cultural safety, but also the culture generally um, of, of of departments that makes uh, people welcome and values the contribution they make, and that's where you get. You know, to me, it's about the, the word of mouth. The difference you can make in in the APS is how you attract people, um, and and that's the same for young people as, as it would be for Indigenous people. Wanting to be part of the APS means you want to be part of um, supporting all Australians and making a difference to to people's lives. So you know, you've got to actually show them that that's the actual work that you'd be doing, and and everyone should be able to see that whatever role they're in, they're actually able to do that. And I think that's really important. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really great call out. It's just raising that awareness and being more aware and educating yourself mm. where the opportunity comes up. I think that that's something that everyone can kind of do. Mm. So I think that brings the panel discussion to a close. And I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Grant and Jody, for joining me and sharing their insights and thoughts and experiences. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I'd also like to thank all of you for watching and contributing to the West Australian edition of the State of the Service Roadshow. Now, while we have not been able to answer all the questions, we'll be sharing the questions with the APSC executive and the panel members, and a recording of this session will be made available on the APSC website. Thank you.